I don't recall a time where I personally saw somebody different and said, wow, they're different. Yeah, that's but not But I yeah. do know there's other people that do do that. Yeah. And I do know, like I said before, kids do. So just knowing that, I mean, of course, we all went through our own bullying issues as a child anyway. So yeah, just being like being anywhere like at a, like anywhere from like eleven to like sixteen just was a struggle. Right, right? No I haven't met. What you're dealing with, yeah. I haven't met one person say no. I never had. Yeah, a they're problem. like I'd go back for sure. Yeah, right. Nobody. <laughs>
like uh, going back to what we were saying before about life is once you realize how important life is, those things doesn't matter yeah. as much. Now, I, I will admit, I go through stages where I'm thinking, oh my gosh, is everybody looking at me? Um, but sometimes I have a friend that remind me like, hey, you're worried about everybody looking at you, but they're looking at a person who is making the best out of life. So instead of thinking that everybody's looking at you negative, think about it, you might be inspiring. So after that, I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to try to, you know, it doesn't have to be another amputee. It could be somebody down in life. And it's like, hey, yeah. this is what I went through. Let me give back to, to that person. Yeah, I think as amputees, we're almost lucky because like we wear, like we get to wear our pain on the outside, which, you know, it's like, it's kind of like sick, but bittersweet because, um, it's easy to, for people to see what you've been through. And like, you're just like, this is my armor and I wear it every day, literally. And we forget everybody fights a battle. Right. Everybody's fighting some sort of battle. Um, so going, I'm gonna go back to your recovery process. What did the recovery look like for you? What did doctors tell you? The recovery uh, was very long. I mean, I spent two weeks in a coma and then another two weeks um, just in the ICU. That was that month. And then I was in a nursing home for about four or five five months. Then I got to go home, perfect timing, got to go home on Christmas, spend time with my nice. family. And then it was back to um, a facility where they taught me how to use a wheelchair and um, to, in the future, use my prosthetics. And unfortunately for me, it was a fear. Um, my training was a long fear because my insurance had cut off at the time, health insurance. So I couldn't take physical therapy. Yeah. So all these bad habits was taught by myself. But before that, I wouldn't even try. I mean, when I used my prosthetics, it was literally get from my house to my car. And once I was in my car, get from my car to the trunk to get the wheelchair. And that was it. Everywhere I went, I used a wheelchair. And it took the right person to not push me hard, but not too soft. And they kind of just told me, hey, won't you try walking? And, you know, it started with maybe an hour, a day, to the next thing you know, I was in an airport walking around. I'm like, wow, I really walked around. So it's kind of like, you know, um, I think not just us amputees, but everyone in life, I think don't think we reward ourselves for small steps. We wait for big steps. Yeah, say, the small but, victories, right. the small wins, yeah. And we don't, we don't take the time. So, you know, I tell people all the time, hey, if you did something new or you did something different that's beneficial, reward yourself. I mean, you don't have to throw a party, but by yourself. Uh, yeah, silent celebration, yeah. something, yeah, for yeah, sure. Something. I totally get that. That's, it is funny, like everybody's rehab process, I feel like is different. Some people like, I hear, especially since I moved to Austin, um, some people's recovery processes, it's very cohesive. The therapists talk to the prosthetists and they talk to the doctors and it's like a team effort, but I think that that's more the exception right. to the rule. Going back to, Ironically, what you just said, having a team, I realized that there's some people without a team, you know? So, I mean, when I got to that step and I was like, oh my God, my life has changed. I'm more free, I'm able to walk. Um, yes, people are still staring at me, but not in that pity. I felt like, well, are you reaching out to people that might not have a team? Like logically, it makes sense that you're not the only person that goes through amputation, that you're not the only person that goes through pain, but when you're deep in it, like yes. it is isolating. And um, we forget, like doctors forget too, like they go to, that's their job. They just go to work every day, that's their job. And they go home to their family and they do whatever they want. And um, they, we, there's so much that's lost in the conversation right. and the emotional experience, I think as well as, cause I mean, obviously it's, it's hugely physical, but trauma and loss, all those things. Like I just heard recently, people actually compare the loss of a limb pretty much the exact same as the loss of a family member, the loss of a, of a person, because like wow. there's still the same stages of grief um, that people need to go through really in order to accept it and move on. Um, so I know like something that's really unique and cool with your story is you kind of found a creative outlet. Yes. Um, tell me about that. Yeah, um, I definitely think art has saved my life multiple times. It saved my life and the youth from keeping me from going down the wrong path. So my art started with music and then later with photography. But, you know, sometimes it's, it's definitely escape for me. I mean, and that was my rehab. I mean, I remember being in the hospital going, I wish I could make an instrument. I wish I can. Yeah. And I was in a nursing home. And when we found out that it wasn't going to be two weeks, it was actually going to be months. 
um, my family surprised me with a laptop and some recording equipment. So oh, cool. I'm in the nursing home. I feel sorry for anybody who's in that nursing home. I'm going to apologize now. On behalf of humanity. <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> I know it was super loud. And then they're like, I'm hearing that song for the last hour. Please, <laughs> somebody stop it. But yeah, it was, um, it, that was my tunnel yeah. um, to avoid depression was to go, I'm feeling a little bit down. Um, I just heard a song I like on the radio. What can I do similar to that? And just writing things down, um, putting my, I'm definitely not a musician, but you know, one of the pieces that I wrote was just a dedication to my mother. It was collecting the pieces of my motorcycle accident and putting it into a poetry form. And I started speaking, you know, different venues. And it's great because it's kind of like not just repeating the story over and over, but it's repeating it in a way that you can memorize. So it's like, I know it off the back of my hand and yeah. it's, it's so great but what I love about it is not just the stage performance but there's somebody out there I have never did a show that somebody didn't pull me and go hey I was going through this so I definitely think art was definitely my therapy it was it was a lot yeah well and it's also the cool thing about art and anything creative really is it transcends so many things I think for a lot of people people that stare at you whatever I think people with disabilities I know growing up I wasn't I was never around somebody with disabilities, didn't know about the world. It seems so far away until until it happens to you. It's the exact. And uh, and it it still seems so foreign until like you can contextualize like pain is pain after a while. People experience pain. People hurt all the time. And I think like when you use a creative outlet like the ones that you're using, um, it's beautiful because because people can identify it takes like the otherness and the separateness and it creates it to something that's more recognizable. Exactly. So you started with music, but I know that you do photography now. Tell yes. me tell me what led you to photography. Tell me about this story. Well, photography actually started a year before my accident. Okay. Um, with a basic point of shoot camera, kind of, um, and I'm not going like, to lie. Like not one of those like winding ones? Not like the one, it, close. Yeah. <laughs> close enough, <laughs> it's the digital the version one. of the winding. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it was so basic, but um, <laughs> it was funny because I got into photography actually because I wanted to show off my motorcycle. So it well, started you know. with... It's your baby. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so it started all with pictures of the motorcycle. Then it was like asking, you know, some models, hey, could you pose on my motorcycle? Not looking into lighting and anything like that. But after the accident to have, trying to figure out where my life was going to go. You know, I was a motorcycle salesman, as I said before, and I've been doing sales all my life, cars, um, radio shock, anything. So when I had to really think about where my life is going and where it's heading, I was like, well, you've been doing music all this time, you love photography. And then it really hit me, I was like, maybe this is God's way of saying to follow your dreams. I meet people every day. I've just met a young guy yesterday, and he was like, well, I kind of want to be a model, but I'm doing that. I say, hey, your nine to five is just your savings to get to that next step. Yeah. You have to follow your dreams, you know? So, I mean, um, photography just, I don't know, it's, if I'm stressful, I'm taking pictures. There's been times where um, I knew something was wrong with my leg, so I shouldn't be walking around. So I'll just drive around and stick the camera out the window, yeah. find a landmark and keep going. And it, it, it's definitely therapeutic. So, I mean, um, yeah, I, I just think that art can definitely save a lot of people, you know. And, and then I started thinking about, too, um, going back to what you said about the image. I was like, well, I'm grown, so I can handle people staring. But what about the little kids that might be going through yeah. this that don't have as much tough skin? Yeah. So, you know, I started dabbing on that, like, you know, talk to people and just being out more. And I hate to say it, but this is the first year that I wore jeans like maybe three times because I'm like, I want people to know what's going on. I want people to ask and yeah. I want to be able, and to hear kids, you know, I've I met kids in wheelchairs and things like that, but I know they're being bullied. Mm -hmm. So I reached out to a few people and that's, um, I met Mr. Deshaun Jackson, who was working on a book about bullying and I helped him on things of that nature. And then that's when I had um, met a music and me company, which they are anti-bullying as well. So it was like, hey, take your story and let's inspire other people. Yeah, no, and I think it's so cool that, that now, like, you're doing a lot of speaking stuff, especially anti-bullying campaigns. Um, I think, first of all, I think the word bullying, and maybe it's just my personal opinion, it's, um, it's got, like, a bad rap. Like, I think it sounds corny, so people don't like talking about it. Okay. Um, especially kids. Like, I work with teenagers. Like, teenage kids, I don't think people like to admit 
that they've been bullied. And um, especially I've run into like my demographic, honestly, I'm like, I'm like, I grew up like middle class, like, you know, I'm like this like bubbly cheerleader white girl. And it's hard for me like to go into certain schools where people have like actual different cultural problems on top of just having a physical difference. And okay. I think like there's such an important need for people to go back into their communities and be like, I am you, you are me. We're experiencing the same thing. Like pain is real and we need to be nicer to each other. <laughs> um, Michael, you mentioned working with Deshaun Jackson. Um, how, how did you come about working with him and other guys in the NFL and other celebrities um, as far as with your bullying, anti-bullying campaign? Yeah, so many different avenues and I have such a supportive team, you know. I think with Deshaun, the, the thing, like I mentioned before, is being an artist and I started getting into t-shirt designing. So I had a mentor who was just like, hey, I love your designs. I'm like, really? I'm doing this, like I said, artist expression for me is an escape. Yeah. So he's like, I really like these designs. Um, I'm going to run it past my cousin. So then all of a sudden I just get a ton load of pictures, just Deshaun Jackson wearing my shirts. When are we going to meet? So I'm like, my mentor was just like, dude, I love your story. And more people need to hear it. What I want you to do is I want you to grab your camera. I'm going to pay you to do photos at a charity basketball game. But this is how I'm going to introduce you to these um, players. So I'm meeting these players and they're just like, immediately, as soon as they saw my legs, hey, dude, come here. Hey, how are you? Blah, blah, blah. This is my name. And PR is coming up to me. Hey, you know, giving me cards and stuff. So hearing his book, he said, I got a surprise for you. And being that he didn't know who I was, he just knew I was a guy that design shirts. And he showed me his book. And when I saw the character with the empathy, I'm like, wow. Like, you know, so I'm reading through it and it's all about anti-bullying. I'm like, wow. I mean, Meeting him definitely was a great experience, but to see someone with his status, someone who is rich that can just say, hey, I'm a football player and that's it. But to go out and say, hey, I'm going to vouch for these kids who's getting bullied. I'm going to take this message and I'm going to put it into book form and I'm going to put it out there. So with that being said, I mean, I'm showing up to that game and just getting introduced just from the t-shirt aspect. Um, these players was like, hey, um, I love your story. I want to support so um, that opened up different avenues um, and word of mouth out of nowhere, I'm getting calls. Hey, um, would you like to photograph Vernon Davis? And just to hear so many people, I mean, I'm not going to lie. I do get starstruck sometimes because some of the people I do meet are people I've been following for a very long time. Um, I have people who, who are signed to multi-million dollar recording labels and stuff that I know, but the link between all those people and me is that they all have a mission. It's not just, hey, I'm a celebrity. Would you do my picture? It's like, hey, you're going to do my picture, but I'm also going to tell you about this that I'm working on. Um, would you like to speak at this and in different opportunities? So it's not that a person who, who wants to give back to the community to the community, it doesn't seem like we have to even look for engagement. Yeah. It just seems like, you know, people want to help. And it does make me feel good. I like to speak more about kids because they are the ones that's learning to get into their skin. So they need more inspiration. Yeah. And I just think companies need to do a better job at, you know, um, putting the mission that, yes, people are different. But, and going back to the bullying, I mean, I think it would be less bullying if kids can probably be a little bit prouder to stand up to it, but like, yeah. you know what? Yes, but you know what? Such and such said it's okay. And um, I heard the president say it's okay for me to be there. So I know it's a reflection on you. And I think that's something as adult, we you know, most people who are bullies is a reflection of their lack of confidence or insecurities, but yeah, Not or true. even fear and confusion, I guess, on things yes. that are unknown. And that's, that is why having bigger companies, I think, um, show people disabilities, show people who are just different in general in more campaigns. Because the more normal it is to see, the the less of a target I think it is, like as far as in, even in schools and as far as even having people stare at you, you know. So tell me a little bit more about some of the bullying stuff that you're working on now. Well, the bullying stuff um, is just using my, I, I hate to use the word negative image, but I would just say the way people see me yeah, in a negative Yeah, well, it's way. realistic, because right. you're like, I live in reality, I know how people think. Yeah, I know, right. I was thinking that before, you know, yeah. Well, luckily for me, I never see, so I don't yeah. I don't have a, a memory of looking at somebody going, they're different. Yeah. You know, I've seen people in wheelchair, but I, I don't recall a time where I personally saw somebody different and said, wow, they're different. Yeah, that's But not I do yeah. know there's other way, there's 
other people that do do that. Yeah. And I do know, like I said before, kids do. So just knowing that, I mean, of course, we all went through our own bullying issues as a child anyway. So yeah, just being like being anywhere like at a, like anywhere from like eleven to like sixteen just was a struggle. Right, right? No I haven't met. What you're dealing with, yeah. I haven't met one person said no. I never had. Yeah, a they're problem. like I go back for sure. Yeah, right. Nobody, nobody's trying to go back. So yeah, that's <laughs> how I mean getting involved. That that definitely was just a thought process of like, okay, now that you went through it, what about somebody who might not be as strong as you? Not saying that you know I'm some kind of hawk or anything, but just to think that somebody might not have as tough a skin. Mm -hmm. That's how I got involved. Um, and I think me coming out of my show, maybe that's why I started wearing shorts more. Like I said, it's a representation that now you don't have to guess. Yeah. Now you see what I'm going through. Yeah. And, um, but it is, I think, what I leave off, even though that's something very small, just talking to that person, that might be something they didn't know yeah. about. Because like you mentioned and how I mentioned, I never met an amputee, so you don't know what their everyday life. So that little five minute conversation now it's in their head and now there's something they can share to somebody else. And the beautiful thing that I like, I think we were talking about the contrast of children and adults, like a kid will just come up and straight up ask you and like that you can, this I can work with, you know, a kid's like, hey, what happened? Um, but adults, I feel like adults, like we carry so much more like emotional baggage with our bodies, like as we get older. So I'm noticing like adults want to avoid something that's so clearly obvious. Like, again, like I cut my, the pant leg off my tights when I have to wear tights. Um, like I'm like, I know what ha like I know that it's a fake leg, you know? And right. I think people try to avoid, um, they treat it, you know, like a white elephant in the room and, and you're like, it's you're like, I'm wearing shorts, it's clearly okay. You're like, I got the memo. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. I think the only hard part for me is when they don't ask questions, yeah. honestly. Um, someone, a grown up adult, um, whatever, coming up to me like, hey, I, I just want to know what happened. I'm cool with that. Yeah. Um, but the only two problems I have is the staring without asking questions, which I normally just compliment them with a smile or I'll speak first. Or... <laughs> That's I'm like, hello. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> hello, <laughs> I see you. <laughs> exactly. So it's kind of like, you know, either they're going to be thrown off or they're going to be like, oh, hey. Hello. And then yeah. thank you for an introduction. So now I can ask my question because yeah. I was a little shy. Um, but... The second problem is when kids say something wrong and their parents don't correct them. Kids mm -hmm. are kids. So if somebody say, hey, cool robot, I'm okay with that. But what yeah, did their mother say that. after that? Did the mother say, hey, did you ask them? And I actually have parents actually say the right thing. It wasn't like, oh, just don't say that, which is fine too. But I actually have parents go, no, go ask them. And not even like, I'm going to ask for you. It's like, no, him, you go there. Yeah. You're curious. You ask them. And I'm like, you know, cool. And we have a great little conversation. I can... Get on a kid's level with conversation. Yeah, because like, it's not scary. And I think parents sometimes, like, when parents, like, for the sake of politeness, they're like, no, don't do that. And I think, like, it registers in a kid's brain that you're like, oh, this is something scary. This is something that I'm not supposed to look at or talk about. And you're like, it's... Well, maybe that's why it's so easy to jump in. Because I don't know with you, but if I hear parents go, no, don't say that. It's like, no, 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 it's okay. Yeah. And then you introduce, but... Um, I do that. I used to have... I have a glitter socket now, but I used to have a hot pink leg, and I was like, I got okay. the pink one for a reason. Like, I was like, <laughs> yeah, come see it. It's cool. <laughs> I like it. You know? Yeah. You talk about feeling like the freedom that, motor, that the motorcycles gave you, and also the important aspect of community. And another huge part of your story you are telling me about was like having your team to get you through the rehab process. And it's almost like... It's almost like you got like two versions of yourself, which is super cool, dope, because like you're even talking about some days like legs just like don't be fitting some days legs just be giving you grief and you're you're talking now you're like i can go in my car and still shoot something if i want to like it's a different it's a different kind of freedom and it's a different kind of community but nonetheless those are still things that seem really important to you and your story michael thank you so much for stopping by it was great to meet you thanks for having me and this was Pick Blast in Gym Class. Thanks for checking out this week's show. Be sure to subscribe to the Pick Blast in Gym Class podcast for an extended interview with Michael, available on all podcasting platforms.